And now, deep thoughts. Listening to Deep Thoughts, a podcast exploring the Christian faith a little more deeply. I'm your host, Matt Schantz, and today we're told to be true to ourselves, to look within for answers, and to follow our hearts. But when we put our own happiness first, we experience record breaking levels of aimlessness, loneliness, depression, and anxiety. In Don't Follow Your Heart, my guest Thaddeus Williams debunks the Ten Commandments of Self-Worship and points to a life beyond the self-defeating dogmas of self-worship to a more meaningful life centered on someone infinitely more interesting, satisfying, and awesome than ourselves. Thaddeus Williams has been on the podcast before about his book, Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth, and he serves as a professor of theology at Biola University. So now, without further ado, here's my deep conversation with Thaddeus Williams. Hey, Thaddeus, thanks for coming back on Deep Thoughts, man. Hey, it's a joy to be back with you, brother. You are in uh, very elite, maybe elite's the right word, or uh, or... I don't know what the word is, but you are in a very small group of people who've been on twice. And so uh, it's good to have you back on. Uh, it was over the phone the first time. Uh, we're doing this over Zoom now. I can see you. It's much, much better. But yeah, man, welcome back. Yeah, man. I uh, I comb my hair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, took a shower. I had over Just because I knew we'd have to be looking at each other. <laughs> Appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, for those who don't know who are listening, uh, you were on episode 36, uh, same title as uh, that book, Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth. Um, and it, it is one of the top episodes uh, I've ever done with Deep Thoughts. And uh, it is great to have you back. Um, a woman in my church uh, came back from a conference where she saw you with a signed copy of your new book, don't follow your heart. She gave it to me, uh, boldly breaking the 10 commandments of self-worship and, uh, said that you were willing to come back on the podcast. So I feel like I have like a new PR staff member or something like that. It's all done for me. <laughs> yeah. I, we were at a TGC, their conference out yeah. in uh, Indianapolis this year and got to meet her and said, by all means, we had so much fun the first time. Why not do it again? Were you uh, there to talk about content from this book or were you doing something yeah. else? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And um, so this book, Don't Follow Your Heart, um, You, I see a bit of a pattern here, much the way that you wrote Confronting Injustice Without Compromising Truth. You had these contributors essentially sharing testimonies that applied to each section. You've done that again, have some great contributors. Um, is this becoming a bit of a model for how you write books? Just tell me a little bit about some yeah, of your contributors. Honestly, man, it's my favorite part of every book is, you know, I'm a theology nerd. I got my head in the clouds and then to find people <laughs> and God sort of just opens the doors and, and leads the right people to me or vice versa. Um, so they share a story that humanizes whatever, hmm theological abstraction I'm talking about. So this book, I was pretty excited. We got uh, Johnny Erickson Tata uh, sharing her story. Um, we got Elisa Childers, former Christian CCM uh, rock star. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh McDowell, one of the, the, the godfathers of American apologetics, yep. shares his story. My personal mentor, uh, dear friend, uh, JP Moreland, shares mm -hmm. his story. Um, and quite a few others that, yeah, for every, this will be the second book that I've done that my book coming out next year, revering God does the same thing where I take, uh, seven systematic theologians talking about how a divine attribute has shaped them personally. And I wow. just find, you know, That's maybe great. it's me reading theology. There's always a struggle of, is this just too in my head? Mm -hmm. Is this too abstract? And it helps to sort of re-enter the atmosphere and bring it down to earth where people live and breathe to hear these truths actually change lives. Yeah. You know, so I, I'm think I'm going to keep that model going forward. Right on, right on. 
Well, if people were to see your table of contents, I'm going to throw some of that uh, out to people in a little bit. But the fact that you started them all with hashtags is not too, you know, abstract out in the clouds. You know, you are that theologian, but uh, <laughs> you're using the language of the day. Uh, those ha- I got a kick out of those hashtags. Um, but you write in the dedication of this book. Uh, you dedicate it to your daughter, Holland. Great name. Yeah. Thank and you. I like that you call her Dutch. That's just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Holland Dutch for short. And we were just in Holland. Oh, no way. Uh, the country three days ago. And so there were plenty of pictures taken of her in front of big, I love Holland signs and you know, all the paraphernalia says, I love Dutch. I love Holland. So she was, she was in heaven there for a couple of days. Was that just you two or the whole family? Uh, we took the whole family. Okay, yeah. I, I have a longstanding relationship with Francis Schaeffer's ministry, Labrie. Mm. Uh, and the Dutch branch of that, I want to say this is my fifth or sixth time lecturing out there. And this time was extra special because uh, I requested that all the kids would would stay in the lecture hall uh, and get to watch Daddy in action. And mm. Holland actually got to do a scripture reading at the Dutch library, you know, in Holland. So it was very, very special moment. Cool. Cool. All right. I see that you did your PhD in Amsterdam. Um, yeah. do, you, do you have, do you have Dutch roots or is that just where you did your, your PhD and now you got connection? I have a lot of uh, ethnic envy. I love the Dutch. Um, a lot of my best friends are Dutch. My wife is Dutch oh, Okay. Uh, among other things. And I did my PhD at the the Free University of Amsterdam, Abraham Kuyper School. And so like a week and a half ago, man, I, I dragged my kids uh, through the rain and sleet uh, from this train to that metro to this mile long walk um, in pouring rain to visit the alma mater. And we all got to take our pictures around the, the bust, the marble bust of Kuiper. Mm-hmm. And it was a big deal for me. They were exhausted, but yeah. they, were, they were good troopers. <laughs> Look at this stuff. It matters to me. Yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's awesome. Kuiper. It's oh, a big deal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One day you'll care. Believe me. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, can we eat some Dutch pancakes? All right. Well, I'm in a community where there's a ton of like Dutch reform folks and uh, uh, you know, a number of them come to my church. So I actually, I have got a soft spot for Dutch folks and I love to just roast them and they seem to really like it. Like I tell them to just <laughs> butt out their cigarettes and like come into church or, you know, like there's just, just some, some good stuff there. But um, in your dedication to your daughter, Holland, um, you mentioned a game you play called Spot the Lie and it's a game you play with your kids. And sure. essentially it's kind of like... I mean, it is the premise of the book is you're inviting people to spot the lie that exists in society today and um, and apply the better story or the Christian vision. Um, Can you just maybe uh, just introduce us a little bit to the book? What prompted it? Uh, What's it about? Sure. It was a few years ago is when uh, Dutch who's now 13 was nine. So four years ago. And the way Spot the Lie works, it's a game I picked up from Oz Guinness, the great Christian mind culture commentator, uh, where when you're trying to raise kids to be discerning and not just passively, um, become chameleons and take on the colors of whatever's around them. Uh, if my kids can spot a lie in whatever they're watching and explain why it's false, they earn $1. And so this was four years ago, Holland comes jumping and bounding down the stairs and says, you know, daddy, daddy, you owe me another dollar. What'd you find this time, darling? And she had just seen a commercial for some pixie, fairy, rainbow, princess, whatever. She said, Daddy, the commercial told me I should follow my heart. I said, okay, so spot the lie. And this was her exact response. And it really was the inspiration for the book. She said, Daddy, I don't want to follow my heart. My heart has fallen. I'd way rather follow God's heart. Yes. And I just like, oh, like teared up, proud daddy moment, wrap my arms around her. She got five bucks for that one. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized, especially teaching it at Biola University, I have about 300 undergraduate students every semester. I've, I've seen a real shift in the last five or six years in the classroom hmm. where anxiety, depression, an identity crisis, uh, these things have have taken a very steep uptick 
And I was scratching my head about why, and the more office hours I've had, the more I've listened to students, it seems like they're buckling under this impossible weight of hashtag authenticity. If, if you have a desire, you have a moral duty to be authentic and express the desire. You have to be true to yourself. You have to follow your emotions. You have to form your identity. You have to not only create that identity, you have to sustain it meaningfully over time. You have to get other people to buy into it. This creator sized task of creating sustain and sustaining an identity has been hoisted onto the shoulders of finite creatures. With this, in the book, I describe it as a cult of self-worship, a religion with its own liturgies, its own commandments, its own saints and prophets. And I just see a whole generation, and this is at a conservative Christian university, and they're still influenced by this because it is so ubiquitous. It's so the water we're swimming in. And so I wrote the book to, to pass on the good news. You don't have to be sovereign Lord over your own existence. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be supreme king over your identity. Um, God is actually, believe it or not, a lot better at being sovereign Lord over us than we are over ourselves. Yeah. Um, so that was really the impetus and inspiration. That is great. There you go. Does Does Holland get a cut? Then she's you know oh, she even sure. she even Big titled. Time. She got her yeah. five bucks. That's it. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> she, she got her five bucks, and she uh, she's thirteen, so she just discovered Sephora which is this oh. like, makeup <laughs> store. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh man. She, she's definitely got it's her not royalty cheap. out of that place. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I like the way you frame it, like, you know, boldly breaking the 10 commandments of self-worship because it really is, there's, there's so much about it that, that has religious connotations. The problem is, is that there isn't this, this divine, um, you know, um, being who can handle that weight, um, the God is self and the self worship and all of that. And of course, like you say, we buckle under that pressure. I heard, um, I heard of, uh, romantic relationships these days. I forget who coined the phrase, but they're not just romantic relationships anymore. It's apocalyptic romance, which, which essentially yeah. is, I'm not just trying to find someone. I'm trying to find the one. And because I don't believe in a, like a higher power, um, and yet I still essentially have the infinite in my soul. I'm going to now put all of the pressure on this person to be everything for me. And so yeah. you you approach relationships that way and ultimately you crush that person. They can't hold up under that weight. And yeah. everybody themselves is carrying around that kind of weight if if they are living out these sort of expressions of self-worship because they can't they can't themselves stand up under that pressure. And so you talk yeah. about this. Yeah. Let, let me jump in on that for a second. Cause when I was uh, teaching at the Dutch Libri a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the, the leaders there, a uh, dear friend, Rob Ludwig made a very brilliant observation that's worth passing on. He said, um, you know, describing self-worship, he made it the exact same connection you just did. He said, you know, we, we tend to do this in romance um, and I'm thinking of how many, how many worship songs, you know, when, when I was in college as an undergraduate, I would sort of scoff at worship songs. It sounded like love songs, mm -hmm. you know, you could sort of swap Jesus out I with the baby and not <laughs> yeah. change enough lyric. That's right. And I thought, oh man, like there's all this um, cheesy sentimental romanticism that's influenced our Christian worship songs. You know, we sort of man-sized God. And I still think that to some extent, but the longer I thought about it, maybe the opposite is also true that maybe our worship songs and love songs sound so similar because many of our love songs, God size men, mm. right? We mm. hoist these supernatural, superhuman God sized expectations. So think of, uh, you know, way back, the temptations had a song that said, you're my everything, Yes. Uh, Brian Adams, the Canadian rocker said, everything I do, I do it for you. Like a lot of these songs read like hymns, mm -hmm. right? You can think of Sting has a song called Holy Grail, where he says to his lover, you're my religion, you're my, sir you're my religion, you're my church, you're the Holy Grail at the end of my search. Um, there's the famous overplayed Hozier song, Take Me to Church. 
Um, yes, yes. I say I'll worship in the bedroom. The only heaven I'll be sent to is when I'm alone with you. So the merger between love songs and worship songs sort of goes both directions. Mm. And part of the the downside of worshiping a finite creature as your ultimate meaning maker, as your functional deity, is the second they let you down, you aren't just let down. You aren't just maybe heartbroken as a finite human hurting another finite human. People tend to be, you know, your term uh, apocalyptic romance. I think that might have been Keller. Um, the idea that when you let me down, my sky is falling. This is a full on existential catastrophe, not because a fellow human let me down, but my functional deity, my God, my yep. Yep. ultimate meaning maker has failed me. And so in relationships, you know, in psychology, they talk about um, idealizing someone they can do no wrong, devaluing them, they can do no right. And relationships very quickly swing from one to the other. If I idealize someone as my deity, then the minute they fail me, it's not a finite failure that can be forgiven. It's an infinite transgression. And so my deity has let me down. And again, like you said, no, no mere mortal can, can bear that weight. So in human relationships, we go from idealizing to devaluing. And the point Rob made at Labrie was there something like that with self-worship. People go from self-exaltation and my feelings are sacred, authoritative, sacrosanct, unquestionable. My identity is the end all be all. And then when they spot failures, they shift from idealizing to devaluing. So that's the irony, mm -hmm. the tragic irony in the cult of self-worship is it leads to an awful lot of self-loathing when we fail ourselves as our own functional deities. Mm. Yeah, that's right. So you unpack these sacred commandments that you turn into chapters and uh, play on the Ten Commandments, play on... Um, yeah, this, this idea of self-worship, you open the book with this idea, hashtag live your best life and, and play on the famous catechism phrase, thou shalt always act in accordance with your chief end to glorify and enjoy yourself forever. Again, we see that replacement of um, the infinite God and putting it into the finite um, to live your best life is, you know, especially with the concept, if this life's all I got, man, I better live it to the full. It's, yeah. it's taking um, that, that Christian vision of, uh, what I do now has implications for forever. And, and, um, even if I suffer here, I've got eternity. Um, when you take all that kind of stuff away and it's just, man, this is all I've got. Well, you'd better live your best life. Right. Yeah. Yep. And that's an impossible pressure. Yeah. And, and deeper than that, it, that kind of self infatuation, um, that, that orientation towards self-gratification at the end of the day, it robs us of awe. Mm -hmm. And so in that chapter, I lay out how, how a lot of the science in the last 10 years has been catching up to the scriptures on this point. There's in the field of positive psychology, there's several scholars out there dedicating research to the theme of awe. What, what it, what role does being awestruck by something bigger than ourselves play in the human psyche? And so out here in California, uh, just up the freeway from me, UCI, University of California at Irvine, a researcher, Paul Piff, has found by subjecting his students to what he calls elicitors of awe, uh, they become what he calls pro-social, less selfish. They care more about the people around them. Um, they care more about God's creation, as we would describe it, or the environment. Um, out at ASU, a, a positive psychologist named Michelle Shiota, she found that this was fascinating. By subjecting her students to elicitors of awe, she would have them read like a terrible article just riddled with fallacies and falsehoods. And then she trigger a mental state of awe, you know, whether it was a, an image of the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, or the sweeping panorama of the Grand Canyon or Mount Everest or whatever it might be. And she found that in a mental state of awe, students were less dupable. They, they were more inoculated to terrible arguments and better at building good arguments. So, so wow. being awestruck 
um, enhances our cog- our God given cognitive abilities. And so, I ar- argue in that chapter that. Scripture has been saying for thousands of years that the number one recurring command in Scripture is, in Hebrew, yira, to fear, to revere, to be awestruck at the Creator. Hmm. And that's deeply tethered to human flourishing in Scripture, and thankfully the science is is catching up. And so this cult of self-worship, one of my many critiques, is it robs people of awe because if I'm fixated on myself— I might like to like to think I'm awesome, but at the end of the day, I'm not as awesome as I might like to think. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the same holds for you and and all the listeners. Uh, We're not as awesome as we like to think, especially as creatures compared to the infinite creator. Yeah. And so that's why following God's heart is better. You find a true source of awe um, that, again, is deeply freeing because you aren't trapped in what David Foster Wallace called um, your own skull-sized kingdom, right? right? That's where this this expressive individualism, this cult of self leaves us. Yeah, we're kings and queens of our own castles. We get to make our own meaning, but we're trapped in our skull-sized kingdoms. Yeah, yeah. If I can back up a little bit, big picture, like, um, like how did we, how did we get here? Uh, like this, this, this self-centeredness, this self-worship that seems to be taking over, um, you know, we, we want to be, I think one, one, I've, I've seen some studies about, you know, the anxiety and depression these days. And, and some of that is rooting, rooted in a sense of meaninglessness or lack yeah. of purpose in life is, is like, man, if, if there's, if, if this stuff doesn't matter, you know, there's just, it, it hard, it's hard to get up for anything. Um, but, but how did we, how did we get here? How did we get here to this sense where there is such a lack of awe? There is, um, such a focus on self worship and self centeredness is, is this new? Is this, uh, what would you say? So there's two answers I could give. I could give sort of the, the historical answer that would take us through, you know, I think the, the French revolution is a real important moment in that story. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the French enlightenment, um, Descartes saying, you know, ushering in an epistemological revolution with, I think therefore I am the autonomous self becomes the starting point of knowledge. Um, you, you could trace it through with, um, Obviously, Fred Nietzsche would be one of the patron saints of self-worship, his idea that you need to transcend uh, the arbitrary human constructs of good and evil. You need to be the ubermanch. Um, He says, um, and thus spake Zarathustra, he says, most people are camels, meaning we're load-bearing animals. We carry around the morality of the past. I should tell the truth. I should care about others. I should treat people the way I want to be treated. I should be faithful to my spouse. And then in his metamorphoses of the spirit, Nietzsche says the next step is we become not camels, but lions and lions devour that old morality. They just tear it to shreds. But he says, that's not the goal for Nietzsche. The goal is to achieve the third state, the ultimate state, that of a child. The child for Nietzsche is the one who, that's his ubermanch, his superman, his superman, plays the game of creating brand new values. So so creating your own value, your own Mm. meaning, your own morality. I define the meaning of my biology. I define the meaning of life. We define uh, the meaning of marriage. We define everything. Um, You know, and then Nietzsche's ideas by the 20th century uh, sort of... um, ferment into existentialism was John Paul Sartre saying, you just exist. You're you're just thrown into the universe um, with no intrinsic meaning. So existence precedes essence. You just exist. It's on you through an act of sheer willpower to instantiate, to create your own essence. So there's a long intellectual story that we could tell through the West, but I think a deeper answer than the historical answer is the theological answer of where all this comes from. And I unpack some of this in chapter two, uh, hashtag OK Boomer. Because a lot of the stuff <laughs> markets itself is like, it's so cutting edge, you know, self-worship and following your heart and authenticity. This is 
This is on the edge of the new. Mm. So, okay, boomer, if you reject us, you're just outdated like those 50 plus folks. Well, I argue in chapter two that the idea of following your heart, being true to yourself is literally the oldest lie in the book. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3, 5 with a serpent who tempts our first parents by saying, you can be like God knowing good and evil. And I unpack that phrase from the Hebrew. Knowing here is not, I know it because I read it in a book. It's not, I know it because I experienced it. It's, I know it because I made it that way. I know it because I made it that way. So you get to be like God knowing, meaning the ultimate meaning makers of, and then it's followed by good and evil, which in, if we hopped in a time machine and went back to the ancient Near East, ancient Jews used opposites to describe everything in between. So ancient Jews would say black and white to describe every color, right? Every, ancient Jews would say uh, the Beatles and Nickelback to describe every band, right? The absolute best, the absolute, you know, apologies yeah. to the Nickelback fans. No correct answer. Uh, and, and so this language of good and evil is ancient Jewish shorthand for everything. You, Adam and Eve, can be the knowing makers of, the sovereign meaning makers over everything. Hmm. And so once you see it in that theological light, what the original temptation was Everything marketing itself is so new and cutting edge and innovative these days, you begin to hear the ancient hiss, you know, be true to yourselves, right? With an emphasis on the S there, you hear the serpentine lie, literally the oldest line, humanity just repackaged to a new generation. Mm. Oh man, that's insightful. Um, there seems to be this real focus. Uh, I, I, well, I see a couple. There, there are a couple of your chapters. Follow your heart, which is thou shalt obey your emotions at all cost. And then yeah. later in chapter eight, uh, hashtag authentic, thou shalt invent and advertise thine own identity. Um, letting our emotions drive the bus, um, seeing, uh, being authentic as like, as paramount. Um, yeah. that's more important than any other sort of value. It's being authentic is valuable. You must see that in the classroom. I mean, with young people yeah. and stuff, um, how should, how do you see those play out like emotions and authenticity? How are you seeing those play out? And then, and then how should we recognize, um, God made our emotions. They're not bad things, um, yeah. but they are like, like subservient things, I guess you could say, um, ambition, uh, or it's not ambition, uh, authenticity is there is a sense in which um, there's integrity to um, being real, being sure. honest, having integrity, a, a, a measure of authenticity in your life. But when those things essentially get twisted, as you're talking about the serpent, twisted and elevated out of their proper position, yeah, uh, what, exactly are, what are we right. left with there? Yeah, that's so good. Um yeah, we don't, the, the call to not follow your heart is not the call to, you know, just, just become a statue, just become stone cold, shut down your emotions, keep a stiff upper lip, become mm. a sociopath and, and disregard. <laughs> like, it, our emotions, are, like you said, they're God given. Sometimes they give us check engine lights to look under the hood. Um, emotions are, are a God given gift, but like everything else post Genesis three, they're fallen. Mm -hmm. Um they can be wrong. And so what I find with a lot of my students, the way this gospel of authenticity um, sort of plays out is, I don't know a better way to say it than just everybody taking themselves way too seriously. If like my emotions like are so important, then I need to exegete them the way I would exegete scripture if I took scripture seriously. Mm -hmm. So, so, let me give just a tangible example here. Um, when I was growing up, I had a neighbor who was a girl, X, X chromosomes, and she was B by those days standards, a tomboy. She loved, you know, skateboarding and basketball. And she sort of dressed like a dude and all this stuff. And in that day, it was like, okay, so there's a girl who is a tomboy a girl who enjoys more um, at this particular cultural moment, more masculine things. Fine. 
But under the, the cult of self-worship, if I'm, if, if she's a female and she has a desire for these things that are typically masculinity associated, she needs to take those feelings so seriously that mm. she needs to wrap her identity up in those feelings. And she's not being authentic unless she now def- identifies as a male. Right. Or, or think of, you know, as, as a man, I can watch, um, Inglorious Bastards or, or Brad Pitt movie and say, he's a good looking fella, right? That's a, he's a aesthetically pleasing male and then move on with my life. Yeah. But when students are so bombarded with this, every feeling needs to be given like this infinite scripture, like epistemic authority. Then it's like, wait a second. I think Brad Pitt is easy on the eyes and I'm a male. I need to be authentic. I need to follow that feeling. If, if I, sub, uh, if I subject that feeling, if I push it down, if I suppress it, then I'm not being my true self. So I must now identify as, I guess I'm bisexual now. It's like, no, you're like any human being with a pulse and functioning eye sockets. Eyeballs. You can see Brad Pitt's a good looking dude, <laughs> right? And any, any female can say, you know, Margot Robo, Margot Robbie is, is easy on the eyes. She's, she's attractive. You, you can just sort of feel a feeling and move on historically, but now under this spell of expressive individualism, no, mm. if you feel that, then you must now mm. make that part of your identity. And that just leads to, again, like I said, people taking themselves way too seriously. And like I said at the beginning, buckling under the weight. So I have um, a dear friend. He shares his story in the book, JP Moreland. He's a, um, one of top Time Magazine's top 50 living thinkers. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant guy by yeah. anybody's stretch. And uh, our offices are about a first down apart. We're about 10, 10 yards away from each other there in Talbot East of Biola. And when I bump into him in the morning, he has sort of a traditional greeting, which is like, how's it going, idiot? Like he just, that's like his nickname for me. And I realize not just for me, he uses it with a lot of his students. Now, now before the listeners conclude, oh, JP belongs on Time Magazine's top 50 living insensitive jerks list. Now, let me tell you what he means and why it's a blessing. It's a, it's a benediction. What JP embodies and what he tries to pass on to me and his students is what GK Chesterton was getting at. When Chesterton said, angels can fly because they take themselves so lightly, mm. right? He would say, you know, That's the great. devil fell through gravity, through taking himself so damn seriously, right? That there's a sense in which <laughs> if we can just be the idiots we are, especially compared to the infinite all-knowing God, that freedom to just say, good morning, idiot, to take each other down a peg in a loving way in a way that's just that kind reminder, hey man, the universe doesn't revolve around us. We are not the center point of being. The chief end of man is not to enjoy ourselves, to enjoy and glorify God forever. Yeah. And so that's where I find uh, self-worship, how it impacts students is this burdensome self-seriousness. And the solution is taking ourselves lightly by taking God more seriously than we take ourselves. Mm, That's great. You've got this line in that chapter, looking to Jesus and laughing at ourselves go hand in hand. That is a great line, right? Exactly. You're an idiot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) What do you say back to him when he says that to you, by the way? Oh, I'll usually greet him also as idiot, Uh, sometimes moron, sometimes schmuck. Uh, We mix it up. We keep it fresh. That's fantastic. I love that. That is really, really good. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. (laughs) Get creative with it. I like that. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that authenticity, taking ourselves too seriously. I mean, we could dive into cancel culture and everything there as well. Like you, you went, you went, you went, you know, you didn't color in between the lines there. You're automatically canceled. It was just such a taking ourselves, taking everything so seriously. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't have sensitivities, but that's a very uh, insightful thing there. Let's go down that road for a second. Yep. So cancel culture 
um, is sort of the equivalent of the Inquisitions and religious history, right? You've committed heresy. Huh. Yeah, yeah. And so you need to be effectively canceled for transgressing something sacred. Yeah. And so under historic Christian theology, the creator-creature distinction, you have God. And, and because God is God, we aren't at liberty to deny dimensions of him that we don't accept or approve of, right? Theology isn't a trip to a subway sandwich shop to say, you know, go heavy on the mercy and grace, but I'll pass on the wrath. Like, no, God is, is simple. He is a package deal. You, you can't piecemeal him out hmm. and custom tailor a God to your, your personal preferences and to deny any attribute. If I came along and I said, you know, I love the Trinity, but divine justice and wrath, no, thank you. I would be legitimately guilty of heresy, creating a false God in my own image. Yeah. Now watch what happens, Matt, if we erase the creator creature distinction, then that role of identity making falls again on the creature. And so now everybody becomes their own, what uh, Arthur left an, an atheist legal theorist, he said, we become godlets, godlets, like tiny little gods running around. Mm. And, and so now I'm my own sovereign meaning maker. And so if I define myself a certain way and somebody rejects it, rejects that, that's not, again, a finite creature violating a fellow finite creature and them just having a disagreement. It is somebody rejecting an attribute of what in the expressive individualist universe is God, the self. So that's heresy. Mm -hmm. Heresy can't go unpunished, right? So now this, the, what I'm describing is this extreme self-seriousness means that we need heresy trials. We need tribunals. We need inquisitions for anybody who would dare question the sovereign self's identity. What, what's happening in our in our culture right now, you know, we're sort of conditioned to think, oh, this is political. This is just politics, culture wars. It's way deeper than that. It's theology. Mm -hmm. Everything happening in the headlines with, you know, pronouns and bathroom access and female sports and even abortion, right to life. It's all theological. It all comes down to the creator creature distinction. That is so insightful. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, you talk about this this concept, which is, which is very prevalent and obviously tied into this as well. This idea of you do you, uh, thou shalt thou shalt live your truth and let others live theirs. H how does that work? Is that there is a clash here? Um, Christianity is is exclusive in this uh, that that exclusivity claim of of Jesus is the way. Um, that clashes. And I think it makes a lot of Christians uncomfortable in our moment to be like, we, we butt up against this and maybe are swimming in it ourselves and maybe drink a little too much of it. We think, yeah, like you know, they have their beliefs. I have mine. All the while as Christians holding this belief that we need, we want everyone around us to come to know Jesus. So how do we interact with this um, yeah, cultural norm? Uh, that that's deeply embedded, which is, um, don't tell me how to live my life. I'll live mine. You live yours. H how do we approach that as Christians? Yeah. Great question. So I think it was Barna that, uh, in the last year had, no, I, I take that back. It was like in the last two years, they had a study of, you know, different generation groups, you know, from, uh, boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, uh, specifically in their attitudes about evangelism. And the group that rated themselves the highest in terms of their evangelistic efficacy, like we got this, was the millennials. Uh, over 70% said we are competent at sharing Jesus. Um, but perhaps unshockingly, many of them also answered that to disagree equals judgment to disagree with somebody equals judgment. And when it came to the question, should you share your faith with someone of another faith in hopes of changing their minds? The majority said, no, you shouldn't do that. And then the follow-up question showed why, well, that would just be flat out judgmental. And, and so underneath this kind of pseudo tolerance is the idea that if you disagree with someone, you can't love them. 
not only can you not love them, you're being judgmental. So you should be branded with the scarlet B for bigot, right? The, the scarlet P for phobic, the scarlet H for hater. And I just want to push back on that assumption and say, in what universe does loving someone require you to embrace, accept, and celebrate their beliefs and behaviors? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what fairy tale land that happens. Like just uh, two or three days ago, my wife and I, with all of our little kids, were you know, my wife and I were schlepping our kids all around uh, Europe in, in the winter. Uh, we're all freezing our tuchuses off. And uh, at, at our last train stop before we flew home, um, I decided um, the kids needed McDonald's. And so I ran and we almost missed our flight. And and when we, when I got back, my wife wasn't like, slow clap like i'm so i'm just celebrating that decision i'm so proud of you that you did that i just want to embrace who you are and what you did no she was ticked off and here's the miracle of miracles she still loves me yeah imagine that we disagree and she disagreed with my behavior and and she still loves me when i hop into an amazon cart and see that she spent an outlandish amount on some face cream distilled from a rare juju berry unearthed <laughs> in the jungles of Chile. I'm not like, Oh man, that was a good $50 spent. I just, I want to celebrate that. I disagree with her in miracle of miracles. I still love her. When, when our kids chuck a shoe at the other one's head, we aren't yep. <laughs> um, slow clapping their decisions. Love in reality, disagreements, part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. disagreement and judgment is part of that. And so I just want to push back on the presupposition that is, you know, a mark of the culture, but so many Christians have bought into it. And so they just make this connection. God calls me to love. And then they take the syncretistic step. They, they merge the culture to the scripture and say, well, culture says to love means don't judge. So I'm not going to talk frankly about the sinfulness of sin. And if there's no sinfulness of sin, the good news isn't good news anymore. So evangelism becomes completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it comes back to recovering a, a biblical notion where sin can only be redemptive, or excuse me, love can only be redemptive if we're actually sinners in need of redemption. Yeah, yeah. If we're afraid to call anything sin, then love can no longer be redemptive. All love becomes at that point is a big you know, pat on the back and I just mm -hmm. celebrate you. And biblical love is so much more rich, yep. so much more multi-layered and can actually bring beauty out of darkness, light out of darkness. And I think, uh, yeah, we need to recover that in this yeah, generation. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It's counterintuitive. Um, you know, Penn and Teller, like Penn is sort of a noted atheist, oh, yeah. right? It's, which kind of just, it always shocks me when I remember that. I'm like, oh, that's so weird. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. I mean, uh, magicians are allowed to have, uh, have these views, <laughs> but he said something that that's, that really stuck with me. He said, essentially, if Christians believe what they say they believe, and then they won't come and tell me what they believe. His response is, how much do you have to hate somebody to not tell them? Yeah. And and so, yeah. you know, it, it, it's such a pushback on yeah. this modern conception of love. And I, I think what you said is very helpful. We have our Christian beliefs, but then we merge them with the cultural norms and think, well, it would be hateful um, to push back on their views. And, it's, and, and, and Penn is there saying like, you got to really hate somebody to not share if you, if you think that salvation's at stake, you know, and, and uh, we, we do need to be sort of jolted out of, of some of these. Um, yeah. But what we're thinking, what we're thinking here, we're not thinking well and deeply enough about some of this stuff. So as we land the plane here, like how can we, uh, you know, you, you, you talk about, you know, the religion of self and you invite readers to be heretics when it comes to the religion of self. Uh, how can listeners do that? Maybe just some, some, I, mean, I don't know if you have a couple um, yeah, sure. big ideas sure. there, how we can break the self-worship commandments. Yeah, let, let me tie the answer to that to, to the point you were just making. Um, 
you know, a lot of Christians, like we were pointing out, um, we sort of tiptoe around the reality of sin because we're afraid we'll be branded haters, bigots, or phobics or, or worse. Um, how, just real practical down to earth, how to have this conversation with the non-believer. I find it's incredibly useful and powerful and true when approaching the reality of sin to frame it in the first person hmm. in a way that's, again, not taking ourselves seriously, but, but redirects the focus on Jesus. So I, I had a, a professor in my Biola undergraduate days who's, who's still doing great work uh, named Jerry Root. I think he's at, at Wheaton. And Jerry Root was at Oxford a few years ago giving a lecture, I think, on C.S. Lewis's theology. Hmm. And at this uh, fancy dinner with all the big wigs, all the smarty pants, philosophers and theologians, uh, one of the atheists around the table sort of scoffed at him at the table and said, oh, Dr. Root, <laughs> why do you take Christianity seriously? Why would you ever believe Christianity is true? And Dr. Root thought about it for a second and very simple, short response. He said, I just know how desperately I need grace. Hmm. I know just how desperately I need grace. In other words, he's owning up to his sinfulness, his own moral inadequacy, his own desperate need for a savior. And now what's the atheist going to say at that point? Like, <laughs> well, maybe you do, but I don't. Oh, <laughs> like, no, they're not going to play the moral superiority card. No. Or what are they going to say? Like, no, you don't. Like, no, that there's something in talking the reality of objective moral evil in our own hearts that does several things at once in the conversation with the non-believer. Number one, it dismantles the stereotype that Christians think they're saved by their own self-righteousness, because we aren't. We're saved by Christ's righteousness and Christ's perfection. Number two, it's giving an in. It's, it's creaking the door open to the non-believer to quit trying to save face and put their best foot forward like, oh, you can be vulnerable too. Mm -hmm. You know you're not perfect. We can have that conversation. Right. Mm -hmm. And number three, now you're tapping into something they already know, like Romans two, Paul says, even the non-Jew who doesn't have the Torah knows God's law. They've known it and they've blown it. Mm -hmm. the, the human conscience, the law written in the heart. So, so we're bringing them closer in touch with moral reality that points them uh, to their desperate need for a redeemer. Um, so having said that um, in, in 2023, um, this might air in 2024 in the new year. I don't know. Uh, but a few thoughts on moving forward, engaging a culture that's completely um, over enamored with itself. Um, I'd encourage folks to check out um, jointheheretics.com. Hmm. Jointheheretics.com. I have all kinds of resources. There's free articles free lectures, a way to get your hands on the book, the audio book, but there's also a manifesto on there, um, which is my attempt at saying, here's, here's how to move forward. So let me just give um, a couple highlights from this. Um, the cult of self-worship. So, so one thing is just to expose it for the charade that it is. It promises our most awesome life. It robs us of awe. Self-worship markets itself as cutting edge. It's hopelessly outdated. Commands us to follow our hearts, but our hearts are divided and depraved. It encourages us to be true to ourselves, but it makes us unwitting devotees to miserable ideologues. It tells us to be our own moral masters, but it strips us of courage and credibility. It calls us to, you know, hashtag YOLO, the rush of unfettered experience and adventure, but it becomes impossibly dull. Tells us the answers are within, but that's where the problems are. It beckons us to be authentic, but makes us arrogant. Claims we can break the structure of reality, but reality breaks us back. And it advertises itself as loving, but makes bigots and haters of us all. So, so part of being Christian in this cultural moment, uh, like any time through church history, is to expose the idols of the age in the same way that the old prophets would show the false gods of the ancient Near East to be phony and pathetic and, and weak substitutes for the actual God. The flip side of that is, okay, so don't follow your heart, but in the wisdom of my nine-year-old, follow God's heart. Well, what does that look like? Living lives marked by number one, awe for God of the Bible. Two, rejecting the ancient serpent's lie to define our own reality. 
three, following God's heart before our own hearts. Four, rebelling against the doomed philosophies of self-worship ideologues. Five, courage to champion the objectively beautiful, good, and true over the ugliness, evil, and falsehoods of the age. And for the next five, your readers have to go and uh, <laughs> check out jointhehecticks.com. Yes. Um, and, and see what it's about. That's fantastic. Well, Thaddeus, what a great conversation. So grateful to have it with you. Uh, you teased another book coming out next year, which sounds phenomenal. And, I could be uh, in the Three Timers Club. Do yeah, I oh, get like a, a I, I've never, here? I've never had that. Perhaps you'll be the first. So, yeah. And I, I just, uh, just a few days ago, I, I had a conversation with uh, Professor Nancy Piercy about. Oh, yeah. um, the toxic war on masculinity and just the way she interacts with her students and engages there. I was just saying to her, you know, like, man, I'm a little bit envious of that environment. She gets to sit in the class or those students get to sit in the classroom with her. I feel the same way with you oh, that thanks, these man. 300 students you have this semester or whatever it is um, that they're uh, interacting with these kinds of concepts and your, your mind, your kind of work and assessment of the culture and application of the faith. I, I commend you to the listeners, Biola to the listeners, and yeah, super thankful to have another conversation with you. Thanks. Hey, thank you, brother. It's been a joy. I look forward to when Revering God drops next year, joining the Three Timers Club and getting that that uh, that jacket and keychain. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'll send you a special jacket. There you go. Right on. <laughs> Thanks, Thaddeus. I appreciate you, brother. Well, like Thaddeus said, you can go to jointheheretics.com to learn more about living the countercultural Christian life that rebels against the status quo. And you can buy Don't Follow Your Heart wherever quality books are sold. Listen, I've got plenty of great guests and fantastic episodes coming your way. So keep your eyes peeled on the Deep Thoughts podcast. Thanks for listening to Deep Thoughts. I hope it helps you in fostering deep faith.